Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. I'm so excited for my first episode, uh, my first guest episode of 2022. This is such an honor for me. I have on Kelly Noonan Gores. Kelly is the director of the documentary Heal. If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. It's phenomenal. And it takes us on a scientific and spiritual journey where we discover that our thoughts, beliefs, and emotions have a huge impact on our health and the ability to heal. The latest science reveals that while that we are not victims of unchangeable genes, nor should we buy into any scary prognosis. The fact is we have more control over our health and life than we have been taught to believe. This film will empower you, as it did me, with a new understanding of the miraculous nature of the human body and the extraordinary healer within all of us. Heal not only taps into the brilliant minds of leading scientists and spiritual teachers, some of which have been on this podcast, but follows three people on a high stakes healing journey. Healing can be extremely complex and deeply spiritual, but it can also happen spontaneously in the moment. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. Hi, everybody. This month, I'm asking for your support on Patreon. So if you haven't had a chance yet um, to listen to my first episode of the year, go ahead and take a listen to that. And I explain a little bit more about why I am so passionate about Patreon. And one of the experiences that I had this this just this past December with some of my patrons, where we had a one hour zoom call, we were able to chat about everything and anything they wanted to talk to me about. And it was an amazing experience, I think for them, but certainly for me as well. So please head on over to Patreon and help support the show. You can give any amount, five, 10, $20, you can give less than that, but any little bit helps in supporting life, death, and the space between. Also make sure you're following me on Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. And if you are interested in receiving my newsletter, which has biweekly soul wisdoms, please head on over to dramyrobbins.com and subscribe to my newsletter. Lastly, I'm still taking ghost stories for this year. Uh, I don't have any more, so or maybe I have one more. So if you have a ghost story to share, please send that to team at dramyrobbins.com and I will be excited to share it on my show. Thanks and enjoy this week's episode. So this has been a long time coming and I'm so, so excited that you're on. Um, so this month, as I'm thinking about the podcast and the concept of life and death and everything in between, this month we're really talking about living and the power of the mind to help us heal. So what set you out to make this documentary? Oh my gosh, it's an answer I've answered so many times. <laughs> and I feel like it changes every time because there's no one simple, like, you know, tragic event or personal healing, you know, crisis that I went through. Um, I think it just, you know, I can't, it's, it's a long history of little things along my way that um, woke me up to this intelligence of the human body and just like have such I'm just so like, I get so excited when I hear about miraculous transformations and miracle healing. And, um, and I'm just like, just so in awe of mysticism and all of the like mystery of the universe and mystery of the human body and the parallels between, you know, the microcosm of the human cell and, and our planet and the universe. And so, um, just a series of events over my life led me to, want to put all my teachers in a film. You know, I was an actor my whole life since five years old, off and on. I grew up in LA. And um, so I was always on film sets and always wanted to direct and, and make films. Um, and then I finally just kind of aligned with the subject matter that I was passionate about, which is kind of consciousness and, and possibility and, and the intelligence of, of the human body and, and kind of spirit and soul and on all of those questions. So how long were you living this way? Or was there a time where things shifted for you 
in your life that said, you know what, I need to start thinking differently about the way I'm, I'm living and existing. Yes. I would say I was 19 years old. This was a specific moment. Um, I was going to Berkeley. I went to Berkeley my first two years of college. And while I loved the campus and I loved the people and I, and I was exploring all sorts of different, I had so many interests. I didn't think I wanted to be an actor anymore. Um, so I was studying poli sci and, you know, communication and art history and film and, and all sorts of different things to figure out what my passion was in psychology. I love, love, love psychology. The only reason I didn't end up majoring in psychology, because that was, I'm really passionate about it, is because I think you had to take like a chemistry class or something. And you went <laughs> to was, the wrong school, I think. Yeah. I never had to take a chemistry. I had to so take neuro, like, neuropsych. Maybe there was like neuro, maybe there was one science class that I was like, well, I don't know that I want to do that. So in my early days at Berkeley, I didn't commit to it. And then, you know, I, I, I was feeling, I went home after my sophomore year and I was really in a funk and I think it was partly weather. I think it was partly not, I had come from such a strong friend community group growing up. Um, I'm still best friends with the same girl since we were 10 years old. I'm still, you know, a lot of my friends didn't leave our hometown. They kind of married each other. So it's like, I have a really strong community and family at home. And I didn't find that right away in Berkeley. And I feel like all my other peers did. They were like, oh, fresh start college and like Insta best friends with everybody. So I was feeling a little like lost. And mm -hmm. even though I met amazing people, I just wasn't having, I was having a hard time connecting. So um, looking back, I would say I was probably depressed a little bit because I was acting out. I was angry. I was just feeling things that I hadn't felt before. I, I was a pretty happy kid. And so I, I took time off. I transferred to UCLA thinking the sunshine and maybe acting again would, would fill that hole and coming back home. And in between, I had some time off. I traveled with my brother to Australia where he was doing a photo project for college. And this guy I met handed me the book Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Mm -hmm. And I read it on the way home on the plane, the long plane ride home from Australia. And I was like, like my world cracked open. I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been missing. This resonates as truth. It's like, we can, we create heaven on earth if we come from love and we create hell on earth if we come from fear. And so that like really resonated. And, and I felt like I, you know, the, sh my, my, I finally had a rudder to steer life with. And, um, mm. and that kind of set me on my, I guess, spiritual speaking, seeking path. So yeah, 19. So Marianne Williamson, there she is again, right? <laughs> it's interesting because my kind of spiritual journey also began around the same time. And I think when you think about psychologically, what can often happen to people at that time too is, you know, I mean, that's around the time people have psychological breaks and um, sometimes start experiencing psychosis. And it's like, could you go either way with that, right? When you go into these depressions and these dark phases, or do you discover and are you able to start to heal yourself? Yes, yes. So what did you, what surprised you most along this journey in the process of making the documentary? I mean, you've, you've spoken to some of the, you interviewed some of the foremost experts in the field of science and spirituality. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, when I put the, when I was interviewing these people that I put in the film, you know, 99% of them, I had studied their work for so many years leading up to the film. So I was pretty well versed and it wasn't like new discovery of information when mm -hmm. I was doing these interviews. It was like, I pretty much knew what they were going to say. But something that Bruce Lipton, um, a couple of things that like, I really love the takeaway from Heal is realizing that between the ages of zero and seven, the way our brains are developing, we're just downloading <clears throat> our programs, our software. So the brain is the hardware and we're downloading the programs and the energy and the, the, you know, the beliefs of our, of our caretakers. So our parents, our um, teachers, whoever is raising it, our, our grandparents, whatever, our community. So it's, it's not written. They, these become our subconscious programming and 95% of the time we are just running programs. So we don't have to exert energy on, on, you know, doing things. That's why we were driving down the road and, you know, 15 minutes could pass and you like, don't, you were thinking. So you're subconsciously 
you're running programs to drive the car and be safe and be aware of your surroundings, but you're actually deep in thought about something. You're, so you're using your conscious mind and your subconscious programs are actually driving the car. Mm-hmm. And, and you're like, oh shit, I don't even remember, you know, going through the past 15 minutes. Right, right. Um, how, did I so, get, how did I get here? How did I get here? You know, because I was so focused on what I was thinking about. So, you know, the subconscious programming is really helpful, but what Bruce pointed out is 75% of our our belief systems that we download from other people between these ages of zero and seven, uh, and I say zero meaning in in utero, you're you're getting imprinted and stuff, um, are negative and disempowering. And so, you know, part of the healing process that we all go through is this awakening to, oh, what are the belief systems that are, what are these constructs that I've built in my brain and my mind that are limiting me and holding me back and, and causing me to attract an abusive relationship, causing me to attract, uh, you know, stay stuck in a job that I hate, or all of these things come from our subconscious programming. And so to wake up and learn how to become aware of those, bring them to the conscious, um, and then and then shift them and replace them with new positive empowering beliefs, that's, you know, that's a massive part of healing. And um, so just to become aware of that was like, oh, wow, yes. And now those, those programming color the lens. So it's like we all have these... Mm-hmm glasses on, whether they're rose colored or, you know, negative or, you know, whatever our personality is, we're looking through this lens. We don't even know, we're not even aware we have this filter and this filter is made up of our belief systems. And that's why when people say things are genetic, I think the majority of, you know, things that we pass down through quote unquote genetics, because DNA is just a blueprint. Once you learn about epigenetics, these belief systems these the belief systems cause our lifestyle habits and decisions, which then you know continue to repeat the same patterns of health and psychology and, and everything from our family. So, um, so it seems like our genes are causing uh, us to 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 present with the same issues that our parents, or our grandparents, or our family members did. But I think it's actually this subconscious programming that we're not even aware of that we're just replaying through generation to generation until someone wakes up and changes it and heals. Well, and I, I think you would have been a good therapist because you picked out the part that I love the most, which is the, the process of making that unconscious conscious. So you're not responding from that pre-programmed place all the time, but you're really thinking, okay, I know that's my past speaking here and not what I'm currently experiencing. So how can I shift that? So I'm aware of what I'm currently experiencing and can respond to it from a place of now versus from a place of my history, my past, everything that happened to me, which is going to be very different. And what I often say to my patients around this too, is that how I would respond to the same exact situation is going to be different than how you would, because exactly what you said, because of those glasses you're wearing and those glasses are colored by your experience. And those experiences determine how you're going to respond now. So totally. exactly, exactly. I, I could not agree with you more. So, so let's talk a little bit about traditional medicine versus alternative holistic and energy medicines. And how do you talk with people who have limited access to those things or might not have the funds or the time. You know, I think if let's take cancer, for example, right? If you're diagnosed with cancer immediately, right? You're, you're going to be most people launched into this fear-based state. And I know we got connected through uh, Jeff Rettinger, Rettinger, mm-hmm. Rettinger. I always say his name wrong. Every single time. <laughs> Rettinger. Yeah. Rettinger. And, you know, one of the things that he studied was this notion of spontaneous healing that can happen. But I think that that's hard for people once they get a fear, once they get a diagnosis that's riddled with fear. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, sort of your thoughts on that and just kind of traditional versus alternative practices and, and how you now maybe incorporate or don't incorporate those different pieces. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I think medicine, you know, a lot of people would say that I'm, you know, holistic hippy dippy and, and are anti Western medicine. And I'm, I'm absolutely not, I think for acute illness or late stage cancer or 
um, things where that's like, you know, you got to bring out the big guns. I think medicine is really life-saving, important and, and phenomenal that, you know, like infection, you know, I'm not going to put essential oils on an infection. I'm going to take antibiotics if I have mm-hmm. to, you know? So medicine is, is just amazing and, and life-saving in, in certain situations. Um, sometimes we need medicine, even, you know, so far as like a psychiatric medicine to bridge us, um, to get to a place where we can even just like function to be able to like create the environment where we can self heal. So it's just like a doctor sets the bone, the intelligence of the body heals and regenerates the bone. Sometimes we need a medication um, or a therapy, you know, or a, you know, energy medicine, whatever, some, someone outside of us to facilitate and hold space and, 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 and bridge us so our body can heal itself. Um, So yeah, I mean, and the other the other aspect of it, I just interviewed Bruce Lipton for the podcast, and and he was like, "Look, we were talking about, um, you know, things with COVID." He's like, "If if it it all depends on your belief. So if you believe that this solution is going to help you, um, and you and you take it, that belief, that placebo is going to enhance the um, the the ability of that thing. But if you have a fear and you believe that." it's toxic or it can, can harm you. He's like, don't take that solution because that belief could enhance a potential negative reaction. Mm. So it's like your belief, what you should do whatever you believe in most, you know? So if you believe in allopathic, like if you believe that chemo is going and radiation are going to, is going to cure you, you know, by all means take that route. You know what I mean? Especially Mm -hmm. if you're in a later stage situation. So I hope that makes sense, but belief plays so much a part of it. You should always tune into what feels right with you. Your intuition is never going to lead you astray and and you have to, you know, develop practices to where you can like really feel into that intuition. Um, But as far as access to holistic therapies that are not covered by insurance and and you know it is it is really tough i will say that some of the most powerful transformational tools that i use every day and learn are are pretty much free and use the the instrument of our body so i think breath work is extremely transformational the we can use our breath to stimulate our vagus nerve which will then help activate our healing systems in our body. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can use our breath, um, like circular For breath. people who don't, I'm going to just stop you for a sec. For people who don't know what the vagus nerve is, can you speak to that a little bit? Oh, gosh. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> my general sense of it is that it's this amazing nerve. It's vagus. It's the, the vag, you know, it's the wandering nerve. So it's, it goes throughout your whole body from your, I think, the, the bottom of your cranial. It's a cranial nerve, right? And it goes all the way through. Um, and it has, it just has tremendous, when you stimulate it, when you activate it, it has tremendous, um, it, it, it's, it activates your healing response in your body through your nervous system. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the people are, de- the pharmaceutical companies are developing drugs that can stimulate the vagus nerve, but we can actually do it with our own vibrations of our breath, our voice, uh, you know, and everything else like that. So it's pretty pretty phenomenal. It's almost like you're playing, you can learn to play the instrument of your own, you know, body, uh, and, and, and stimulate it into healing. So, um, so, so like breath work, meditation, also books. Like, so for instance, if I was someone who had, you know, late stage cancer, I would, you know, most people that I know who have healed and defied odds and statistics have done a combination of Western and Eastern because, you know, they, and not everybody, again, you have to tune in what's, what's right for you, but it's like, sometimes you need to stop the bleed, the proverbial bleeding with the big guns. But then, but then if that's all you change, if you just bombard your body with the chemicals to kill the cancer and you don't change anything about the environment inner or outer, mental or physical, um, that allowed you to create a body in which cancer could proliferate in the first place, that there's a high likelihood that cancer is going to come back. So Mm -hmm. that's just if you bombard and and do the Western mode of attack, which again, can be highly effective, but I would recommend that you do the other lifestyle changes so that you create a new environment in your body so that cancer cannot thrive. 
Um, and there's so much, I mean, the internet offers so much and YouTube and, and if you follow these experts, they, they offer so much content, free content that you can start to, to really, um, wake up and, and make the necessary changes you, you can do. And I love anytime it's with cancer, I, I recommend Kelly Turner's, uh, research and, and work and her radical remission work and now radical hope book. Um, and she has, she's interviewed, you know, thousands of people who have spontaneously healed from end stage cancer, where they were sent home by their doctors and told there was nothing else they could do. And they made these shifts in their life um, and healed. And so that's so inspiring. I think it's important to have examples of possibility that you can grab onto mm -hmm. and, then, and then learn from those testimonies, what they did, whether it's through diet, whether it's reconnecting with loved ones and forgiving, whether it's, you know, picking up the instrument or the paintbrush that you had left 20 years ago. And that brings you so much joy, whatever these things are that, that Jeffrey Rediger talks about as well, that, that, that creates this energy and, and, um, ability for spontaneous healing. You know, you just need, you just need examples. You just need to learn. And there's so many resources out there that can help you get that information for relatively free, you know? Well, and I think too, certainly in Jeff's work, one of the things that was so uh, illuminating for me and a lot of what I focus on is when we can kind of face death and the reality of that, that so many of his, the people that he researched, once they kind of let go of that fear, which I frankly believe is what is the undercurrent of so much of where we are right now is the fear of death and this this belief that we are supposed to in some way be immortal um and that's the fear that we're gripping onto so tightly oh my gosh yep you just nailed it on the head that's exactly right and that's why you know one of my favorite stories and examples and i she's in the film anita morjani mm -hmm. she has in, in anyone dealing with cancer but anyone dealing struggling with fear of death or, you know, not being able to accept their, um, what they're dealing with. I think, I think that's so much of it. Acceptance is the first part surrender. It's like, just, we have to stop resisting what is and fighting back and staying in victimhood, um, and going, okay, this is what I'm facing with. And, and that's exactly what those people did that were sent home to die. They, they just faced the music and they said, okay, with this last, few weeks, months, years that I have to live. I'm going to only do things that I love. I'm going to only surround myself with people that I love. I'm going to take in every sunset with gratitude. Mm. I'm going to feed myself with food and, and clean water and things that make me feel good. And so they just have this shift in consciousness and which then later leads to a shift in their physical reality as well, which is so cool. So I think, I think that is, that's why I think my, my end after all the research and making heal, you know, healing to me is spiritual and it has to do with really letting go of your fear of death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, own, which yeah. is the ultimate resistance that's driving everybody to resist. It's driving everybody to be so polarized right now and in fear and allow them to be hooked by a certain narrative or hooked by a, you know, a conspiracy theory or whatever side of the coin you're on. It's like, you're being hooked out of fear but you, the ultimate underlying fear is you're resisting death. Mm -hmm. Yep. We are completely on the same page and why it's my favorite thing to talk about, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Which is why your podcast is so cool. <laughs> so um, what do you, what do you talked a little bit, you started talking about this, but what do your practices look like in your life? Like what are your healing practices or what are your, I wouldn't even call them healing practices because what we're really talking about here is preventing disease, right? Mm -hmm. How can you bring yourself and your body and your mind to a state of living and, and wholeness? Yes. So what is your day look like in terms of what you do? I know I've watched you on Instagram do some of this, so. <laughs> which I'm so bad at posting on Instagram. I'm oh, I'm I'm terrible. I'm be better at it. Yeah. You did. You had a good. You had a good run there with um, <laughs> the breath work and the abstaining from alcohol and. Oh yeah, that's true. I had a little. I had a little run there in, in the fall. Um, yeah, it's all about. You know what? Ultimately, because people are like, "Tell me everything you eat. Tell me your workouts." You know, because I look like the pillar of health and. 
everyone recently was like, you lost weight. I'm like, I lost weight because I was completely stressed and burnt out. Like you don't want that diet, you know? Right. Right. And then you get sick because your immune system is wiped out because you're not sleeping and you're stressed and you have a, you know, so, um, I would say. And what's hard too, for people, I just want to point out is that that gets reinforced by our culture, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you look great. You lost weight. And then people think, oh, this must be a good way to live, but how they got there is not healthy. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I'm happy to put the five pounds back on. I'd rather be sleeping and sane, you know? Um, but so I think the first thing that a lot of people, it's not about what you do, it's how you do it. It's the intention behind it mm-hmm. and, and finding what feels good. A lot of people are trying to look a certain way or feel a certain way or do the right thing or eat the right thing or, you know, avoid eating the wrong thing. And what I've learned over the last, especially 10 years is just like, give yourself grace, do the best you can, especially, you know, I, you have three children, so you've had lots of lessons of grace over <laughs> giving yourself, like, yes, give yourself they're grace. my little, they're my little spiritual teachers. I'm always like, God, yeah. patience. I'm still working on it. I'm still it, working on it. <laughs> exactly. And we're going to be working until the day we leave uh, the earth, but um, to give yourself grace. So for instance, like I, one of my cruxes, I learned how to meditate 13 years ago. I learned transcendental meditation and I thought it was really helpful. And I highly recommend someone, if you're going to learn meditation, there's so many free resources out there and, and guided meditations on YouTube and cheap ones to download on iTunes or one of the apps. But if you actually learn from a teacher and take a course, mine was over four days you, you, you lock in, you anchor in the knowledge, the wisdom, the why, how you feel you, you really, cause meditation is so kind of like ethereal and you don't know if you're doing it right. And so if you, if you really take a course and invest in it, it is an investment that will pay you back a million fold over your lifetime. So, um, you know, there's so many, there's no right or wrong way to meditate, but for me, I need, there's so much stimulation and information just being thrown at us every day with our smartphones. I mean, we're all addicted to information right now and, um, and our brains haven't caught up to process the amount that we're inundated with. So meditation is a way to balance that. And I feel like if you turn within and cut out all the outside stimulation, everything just like you lower your blood pressure stimulate your vagus nerve, you drop your nervous system out of fight or flight and sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic nervous system. So you're, you're giving yourself the, the opportunity to heal, rest, repair, recharge, regenerate. Um, so to do that practice, you know, is not only healing and just like, I think, you know, imperative to counterbalance, you know, the stress and the, the chronic stress response we're all in because of all this information that's thrown at us mm-hmm. every moment. Um, but then on, you know, if you can put in two times a day, then you can like, then you can go deeper and get into the spiritual, you know, you can not only physically resting, repairing, and just doing all the, the good things to recenter and reset and rest, but then you get into the spiritual, um, knowledge where you're creating so much space in your mind that your intuition, your soul, whatever terms you use can, can whisper to you and you just get downloads and, guidance and, and all of that. It's your internal guidance system. And you have access to that only when you can turn off all this stimulation, quiet the mind and, and create, you know, create that internal space in your, in your consciousness. So um, meditation to me is like, it's like my lifeblood. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how so- long do you, met? I mean, I know transcendental meditate. I did the training with yeah. them as well. That was sort of my, my entree into meditation, which is 20 minutes twice a day. Do yeah. you still do that or do you, has your practice changed? I do what I can when I can. <laughs> so I I also I love my now good friend Joe Dispenza and his meditations and his, you know, he's got these medit he's done so much research and he's doing a lot of research right now actually with COVID and the um and and the response, the immune response when you regularly meditate. I mean, your defenses go up like so high. I and- just, yeah, I was just, I don't know if I read something or someone said that they are looking at 
meditators and non-meditators and their response to COVID specifically. It was some, it wasn't his work, but it was something else. Yeah. And they're finding. He's working with Stanford um, research and, and I think probably like Stanford and one other really prestigious university and they're testing the blood of advanced meditators who meditate, you know, four or five days in a row. And it's literally immune to COVID. It's crazy. So, and and which COVID is one coronavirus, like there's a million, we're dealing with the flu and the cold and all these other, you know, seasonal viruses. So just imagine like what that does to your blood and your immune system. It just, it gives you so much resilience if you Mm -hmm. have a, a, a practice because First of all, just on a baseline, you're shutting down your stress response and you're you're allowing your body to heal, which if we're in constant stress and we never get that switch turned off, um, we're just, we're not allowing our bodies to heal. So they're, they're mutually exclusive. You can't be in sympathetic and rest and repair at the same time. Right. <clears throat> or it's stress response and rest right. and repair. Right, fight or flight and fight or flight. repairing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this last two years, it's, you know, show me a person that's not in fight or flight all the time. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's exciting. So Joe Dispenza has tons of meditations that you can download online. Um, and his work is more, you know, there's some that's like for manifesting and I love, I love taking the reins of my mind and rather than just like, and just like really spending, you know, 20, 30 minutes a day, just like visualizing and feeling into the future that I want, you know? Um, and so he's got great meditations for that and, and also healing meditations, et cetera. So I switch it up. I do whatever I'm in the mood for. Sometimes it's guided. Sometimes it's my own, you know, TM practice, mantra practice. Um, and, and like I said, I do what I can when I can, cause if, you know, with a two and a half year old, mm-hmm. you your schedule is not, not <laughs> your own. Yeah. Your schedule is right. not predictable. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I, I think you're validating me <laughs> as you're talking because I, mine is similar. And I think people think when you have a meditation practice, you need, it needs to be X, Y, and Z. And I've over time, like some practices of mine are, I go right back to my TM mantra. Sometimes I'm in a place where I'm like, today, I just want to kind of abandon everything and just see where I go. Sometimes I have conversations with my spirit guides and that looks interesting. I was talking to a friend this morning. I'm like, what's the difference between me and like the guy on on the corner right now who's talking to God only knows who, but he could be talking to spirit guides just like I am. And he's considered mentally ill. Right. And I'm not. So I, I always think of that too. I'm like, I bet you there's, cause we live by the, you know, we drive by the VA hospital and, and the homeless problem is, is just wild here in LA. And so, so sad and heartbreaking. And I'm just, I look at some of them sometimes I'm like, I bet you they have a lot of like wisdom. They might, they, they might actually like know what's going on more than most of us. Right. <laughs> you know I mean? Cause they're tapped into it. Yeah. So, um, and so, yeah, just back to like daily practices, we we, just understanding the subtle shift of like, I work out because (laughs) it makes me feel good. I know that there's endorphins released from my thing. I know that I can get out frustration and emotion through sweat and, and I'm an athlete. So that's kind of a, a practice that I need to do. But if I, you know, sometimes I need yoga to quiet my mind and just open my body because my body feels tight, you know? So I just, I listen to my body and I do it with the intention to feel good and give it what it needs. I don't, it's the minute that I stopped worrying about weight and and just doing things that made me feel good and doing, it's such a subtle difference. But if you go to the gym because you fear, if you don't, you're going to gain weight um, versus I'm going to go to the gym, even if it's for just 20 minutes, because I know if I move my body, I'm moving my lymph system, I'm detoxing, I'm releasing emotion. I'm releasing um, endorphins, positive hormones throughout my body. Um, that subtle shift will change everything. And then, you know, weight just kind of falls away and you start to, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of my people that I've interviewed, if they dealt with depression, they just force themselves to get up and walk around the block. Just walking and moving your body was like the first step that led to their healing because it's so like walking is just such a, Oh, it, it's so powerful, you know, just mm-hmm. the simple walking. So movement, I think is key. Um, yeah. I mean, so those are my like, you know, meditation and movement and just being outdoors in nature as much as I can is probably my three 
crux uh, daily practices. Yeah, and it's beautiful behind you right now. So I would be outdoors in nature too. I shouldn't show you what I'm looking at. <laughs> Is it cold there? Oh, it's so cold. It's yeah. so cold. I don't leave my house for like a month. Oh man. Um, I know if the sun comes, the sun is out today, which makes a huge difference, obviously, but the drag gray, dreary days are rough. Oi, oi, oi. Yeah. yeah. So how has your life changed or has your life changed since this, this documentary came out or was, was your life already in motion in this way? And nothing has really changed all that much. Um, I think that, I mean, my life has changed just in the fact that, you know, people come to me for <laughs> advice, like healing advice, which I don't know that I'm, you know, authorized to give and in a place to give, but I just, I think, I think my life has changed. Just to, I'm more empowered. You know, I mm -hmm. feel like when you, when you take the leap and follow what your heart is nudging you to do, even though you have no idea how you're going to do it. And you just like follow your heart and you just take the risk and do it because not because you want anything from it, just because you have, you feel like you have to do something like, this is my purpose. This is my calling. I mean, just to satisfy that, um, to do something that you know, in your heart, you want to do, and then to do it, just that alone is so empowering, you know? Um, cause I, you know, I'd never directed before. There was a lot of fear I had to overcome. You know, I had to fake it till I made it. And, and you, you just, in hindsight, it's like, oh, it's so easy. It was a great documentary, but you have no idea when you're embarking on this thing, how it's going to turn out. It was just like blessing after blessing. And it was definitely an energy behind it that was not mine. I just kind of kept saying yes and going, throwing up my hands. Like, Hey, I don't know what's going to, I don't know how to solve this, or I don't know how to do this. So I'm just going to let but clearly it's meant to be done. So I'm just going to say yes. And uh, so it was, it was just a really cool process to see unfold. And I think that I'm just proud that I put out something that is helping people because I get so many messages every day and it's, it's been four years. Um, but it's so cool to see that it, it's like a, every year, there's just a new layer of people around the world that are become open to it so it's well, like and now oh my gosh your timing yeah. was perfect because it was what we what we need yeah just a little dose of empowerment and inspiration right now I feel feel good about you know putting out there for the people that resonate with it and I think a big takeaway in all of this is that you have more control than you think you have yeah in a lot of ways yes I mean less control of the external world but yeah. more control over the internal world. Yeah, exactly. And like, and this is a big part of your work is teaching people that, you know, we can't control outside circumstances. We can control how we respond to them. Mm -hmm. And if you're living in fear and from the subconscious programming, you know, you're going to react to life and be a ping pong of emotion. And, you know, especially right now in, in our extremely polarized <clears throat> uh, society, but if we can, you know, develop the toolbox where we can breathe and, and go, okay, this is happening for me, for me to wake up to where I'm not free yet, as my friend Peter Crone so eloquently says, and, and to look where I'm still getting triggered. Oh, that trigger is a signpost that I have some healing to do there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. So a few speed round questions before we wrap up. Okay. This is this is new. I'm trying this out this this season. Okay, fine. Spirituality means. Oh God, spirituality means um, uh, anchoring into some divine intelligence that is loving and beyond our understanding of loving and intelligence uh and and really trusting that it it has your back oh i like that one um what is something most people don't know about you oh man oh my gosh well um let's see i don't i love cleaning my ears <laughs> I guess that's my thing. <laughs> It's so weird by cleaning like three days a day. Um, it's probably bad for you. But, and then I don't like eggplant. 
or mushrooms. I have to get my mushrooms through. Like I know it's terrible. I know mushrooms are so good for you, but just like texture wise, I don't eat. I'll eat a truffle on a pasta, but uh, I don't eat a lot of mushrooms. I have to get them through my like like little. Can you take them in a vitamin seven tinctures. Yeah, okay. yeah. I get them in the diet, but I don't eat them, which is I need to work on. Oh, and I don't like peas or green beans. Isn't that weird? Huh. There's like specific foods that I cannot. I just can't. I can't. I can't put them so down. Does your daughter eat peas then, or no? She does. Yeah, my husband eats peas, and he loves them, and so does she. <laughs> <laughs> what is one thing you're really looking forward to right now? Oh, I am, you know, we're January, 2022. I really feel hopeful. You know, last year, as the year was changing over, I was like, guys, New Year's Eve is just another day. It's like, we're not going to miraculously have a new, you know, I was just like kind of bitter. I was like, dude, this, the the turnover doesn't mean anything. Nothing's going to change in 2021. Um, That was kind of my outtake. And and I really... (laughs) It might have been mine too, because it felt like nothing did. <laughs> and nothing did. I was, I think I was correct. Um, but it feels, I really feel, and you know, in I've done a lot of work leading up to this, but I really do feel that there's an energetic shift upon us. And there is, you know, Michael Beckwith, one of my teachers, is like, you know, break down before breakthrough. And I feel like this is the chaos um and the the ickiness, the the really uncomfortable time of the caterpillar and the darkness and the goop and the, uh, 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 that's happening. And then we're going to, you know, I really, I know this sounds happy, but I really feel like this is the discomfort and the intensity and the darkness before, you know, the dawn, before something new is going to emerge. And so I really look forward to seeing that all unfold. Mm-hmm. I hope you're right. I have to be right. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, you will be. You will be yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is one thing that you are grateful for right now? Uh, I'm grateful for my daughter. Um, I've been so busy this past six months launching the Heal podcast, and I had no idea what I was biting off. I'm sure you can relate. Um, and so I really was not as present as I would have liked him in or, or, or should have been in the last six months. And she's so like, you know, they develop so fast and she's in this, like, she's so present and just talkative and, and a lo- like just so fun right now. So I'm, I'm really grateful that I'm able to take a break from the podcast um, and just focus on being a mom with her for a while. What's on your nightstand? What book? Ooh. Um, well, The Course in Miracles and I Am That by Sri Nagardasatta. I I don't know how to say his name, but Mm -hmm. it's it's a book called I Am That. And it's, I I can read like a page a day and it'll still take me like five years to read. But um, it's, yeah, these are, I'm just trying to like every day just soak up a little bit of my spiritual, you know, remembrance. Mm -hmm. What is the most transformative experience of your life? Ooh, I would say, I mean, I would have to say natural childbirth, you know? I mean, I did. <laughs> I had one natural childbirth sort of by accident. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Like your second one just flew out. My third one. My third one. They were like, yeah, he's here. Oh, wow. That's, I, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's, she didn't just come out. She was a, she was a battle, but um, I just think that's, you know, I really wanted to, and I have no judgment about any birth. It's like, whatever is meant to happen is supposed to happen. But I was, my intention was to try to do it naturally and without medication, just because, you know, women have been doing it for thousands of years And I feel like that's what our bodies are designed to do. So I was like, well, I'll just see what I can handle. And it was just a, I had so much support, my best friend, my mom and my doula. And it was just this like coven of witches, like, you know, laboring at home and, um, and, you know, and then going to the hospital and um, having my doctor, like, it was just, and I was just exhausted. I'm like, just get the baby out, you know? It was just like, it's just wild. You're a portal of life. I still don't understand how it all works. And it's just mind blowing and miraculous to me. And it was not magical at all at the end when you're like, you know, (laughs) hold the baby and the tears. It was like the baby was 
blue and slimy and I was exhausted and I was like, what the hell is happening? It was not, you know, like Hallmark movie at all, but it was, you feel so powerful after, mm-hmm. after you give birth to a child. So yeah, was- I love that. Well, your documentary is Heal. It's on Netflix. Uh, it changed. It was on oh. Netflix for two years. Yes. So sad. Um, and then Netflix kind of took a left and decided to do all their own content. So they gave us the boot, but we went to Amazon prime and oh. they're, they're good too. So it's, again, we're okay. just like spreading the love around to different audiences. You know, it was on Netflix yeah. when I watched it. It's now really it's on well Amazon now. prime. <laughs> yeah. Now it's on prime. And you have a book too, heal, yeah. which, um, is the companion and it goes through like a lot of what you talk about in the, in the documentary. So some of like the best excerpts, I feel like of what people were saying. So people can buy the book, they can watch the show and where can they find you? Yeah. So we are on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, YouTube and all the things, Facebook at, at heal documentary. Um, and we, you know, we put out, try to put out content and then we have the heal podcast, which is on Apple and Spotify and anywhere podcasts are found, I guess. And, um, I'm personally probably most active on Instagram at Kelly Gorris. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for your time today. I'm glad we made this happen. Um, I appreciate it. And I look forward to continuing to watch what you discover and what you find. And I'm learning so much from you. So thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. And I can't wait to talk more about all the stuff you do, all this, the medium and life and the death. I, I want to learn more too. <laughs> so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between.